Hello everyone, it's Scott, and we're back for our first look at Dustmourne House of Horrors. This is going to be the September set release this year, and it's built around the idea of a haunted house. So let's dive in to Dustmourne. So the first card we want to look at is the Wandering Rescuer. The story behind this set is going to be Nashi, who is from Kamigawa, is going to get lost on the plane of Dustmourne, and the Wanderer, Kaido, and friends are going to come to Dustmourne in search of him. So let's talk about the Wandering Rescuer. So for three and two white mana, you get a legendary creature that's a human samurai noble. So this is indicating that the Wanderer has been desparked. It's a 3-4 with flash and convoke. And what convoke means is your creatures can help cast the spell. Each creature you tap while casting the spell pays for one or one mana of that creature's color. The Wanderer has double strike and other tap creatures you control have Hexproof. So an interesting card and one that I think we'll see play in Standard because that ability to convoke it into play early in the game, potentially as early as turn two, given the convoke deck that we already has that's using Nine Aaron of EO. So I think this is a card that we'll see some play in Standard. So we also have two additional um, frames for this. We've got our double exposure frame in the middle here and then our psychic frame on the end um, so we're going to see different frames of this as well in the set next we've got overlord of the haunted woods for three and two green mana you get an enchantment creature that's an avatar horror that's a six five it has one of the new keywords impending it has impending four for one and two green mana. If you cast the spell for its impending cost, it enters with four time counters on it and it isn't a creature until the last is removed. At the beginning of your end step, remove a time counter from it. So this is in essence suspend with a different keyword naming. Um, so it's suspend four and you pay three to get it into play. So I can see in some circumstances you play this on turn three for its suspend cost or even turn two because we have enough ramp cards that we can get there on turn two. And then you get it in the mid to late game. And whenever Overlord of the Haunted Woods enters or attacks, create a tap colorless land token name everywhere that is very every basic land type. So you get that additional mana bump on turn two or three if you cast it by getting that extra land and then later every time you attack with it then you're going to go ahead and get those additional lands and that can be very um, helpful in ramping you up to even larger spells in the Overlord of the Haunt. So what we also see here with Overlord of the Haunt are a couple of the additional frames that we've got. We've got our borderless extended art frame and then we also have our Japanese art frame as well that we'll be seeing in the set. Next we've got Enduring Tenacity for two and two black mana. You get an enchantment creature that's a snake glimmer. It's a 4-3, and whenever you gain life, target opponent loses that much life. When Enduring Tenacity dies, if it was a creature, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. It's an enchantment. So if you don't exile this, it's just going to come back as an enchantment. So I think this is going to be, of the cards that we've seen so far, probably the one that is going to be the most impactful on Standard, because I can see any life gain deck wanting to have this card in it because every time you gain life you're doing that much damage to your opponent and because of that i think this is going to be a build around in standard because there's enough life gain cards in white and in black that you can build a pretty solid life gain deck that will be able to continually do damage to your opponent just by playing cards and attacking and doing some not actually demon damage to your opponent but just gaining some life so i think this is going to see a bunch of standard play um and that recursive nature of this where it comes back as an enchantment i think really is the thing that sold it for me as something that's going to be really played in standard 
Next, we've got come back wrong. For two and a black mana, you get a sorcery. It says destroy target creature. If a creature card is put into a graveyard this way, return it to the battlefield under your control. Sacrifice it at the beginning of your next end step. So this is an interesting card. So I can see this in any deck that wants to sacrifice creatures. So you destroy a creature, it comes back on your side, and then you sacrifice it on your side to get a benefit. Or you're doing it on a creature that has haste, and then you're going to haste that into play and be able to attack with it. But the limiting thing of this card, and I think it's... it's going to be somewhat playable in standard is the fact that you get it back and you but you have to have something to do with it if you can't do something with the card you're getting back or it doesn't have an enter the battlefield trigger that would be helpful to you i don't see this is going to have a lot of playability in black death given the fact that we've got such good black removal already but if there's a way to benefit from the creature dying and coming back on your side then i think it has a sideboard option in some of our decks in standard. Next, we've got Toby Beastie Befriender. For two and a white mana, you can legend a creature that's a human wizard and is a 1-1. One, one. And when Toby Beastie Befriender enters, create a 4-4 four, four white beast creature token with this creature can attack or block alone. As long as you control four or more creature tokens, creature tokens you control have flying. So I think this is definitely going to be playable in Standard um, if we continue to have a Legends deck for sure um, because getting that 4-4 four, four Beast Creature token for 3 mana in white, that's a really good value. And we don't typically see white tokens that strong in Standard. So I think this has got some playability in the right deck. Next, we've got Chainsaw. For one and a red mana, you get an artifact that's an equipment, and when Chainsaw enters, it deals three damage to up to one target creature, and then whenever one or more creatures die, put a rev counter on Chainsaw. Equipped creature gets plus X plus zero, where X is the number of rev counters on Chainsaw, and it equips for three. So I can see this potentially if we have an artifact deck um, that this could work in that. My concern for it though is that right now red decks really want to move quickly and this is a little bit slow given the format because it's going to cost three mana to equip it. So unless there's a way to equip this for a lower cost then I think it's probably not going to see much standard play. Now we also get our paranormal frame for Chainsaw. So one of the tropes that they're going to be using for the set is the 80s and 90s horror movie um, where there's paranormal activity on your TV screen and we're going to get a treatment that is showing that in Dustmourne. Next, we've got Doomsday Excruciator for six black mana. Wow. First time I've seen a card like this in a long time where all the mana is in one color and it's that many. So for six mana, you get a 6-6 six, six demon with flying. And when Doomsday Excruciator enters, if it was cast, exile player, each player exiles all but the bottom six cards of their library face down. At the beginning of your upkeep, draw a card. So I'm really not sure where this fits into standard, if it does at all. The fact that you're literally getting rid of your entire deck, that's a little bit weird to me. So it, I can see this if there's a mill deck out there. And we do have a black blue mill deck that is out there right now. So maybe this would go in there. You exile all but the last six cards of both libraries and then you have a Jace on the field or something like that that can then do the rest of the 
um, removal of your opponent's library and you can win the game that way. But otherwise, I don't really see this as something that's going to be really standard playable because you have to be able to win almost immediately to actually win the game. So if there's not a way to do that, I feel like this card's a little bit um, too much of a gimmick to actually see standard play. Next, we've got Screaming Nemesis for two and a red mana. You get a creature that's a spirit. That's a 3-3 with haste. And whenever Screaming Nemesis is dealt damage, it deals that much damage to any other target. If a player is dealt damage this way, they can't gain life for the rest of the game. So very powerful ability on Screaming Nemesis. So first thing is, I think this will be at least a sideboard card in Mono Red because the ability to shut off life game for the rest of the game for your opponent is incredibly powerful. And you can hit your own card with a shock or something else and that'll do the damage and that'll turn off your opponent's ability to gain life because you do deal that damage to them. So I think this is definitely a sideboard that card that's going to be playable. I'm not 100% sure that it'll see main deck play, but definitely a card to look out for in mono red decks. Next, we've got Leyline of Hope for two and two white mana. You get an enchantment. If Leyline of Hope is in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield. If you would gain life, you gain that much life plus one instead. As long as you have at least seven more life than your starting life total, creatures you control get plus two plus two. So earlier I talked about a black-white um, life gain deck using Enduring Tenacity. So I think Leyline of Hope fits right in with that concept. You play this, you gain life, you gain additional life. And then you give all of your creatures that boost because fairly quickly you'll be able to gain that additional life. And you're also hitting your opponent every time you gain life. So I think those two cards are going to synergize well together. And that can be all the difference in winning. Next we've got Nowhere to Run for one and a black mana. You get an enchantment with Flash. And whenever Nowhere to Run enters... The battlefield target creature an opponent controls gets minus three minus three until end of turn. Creatures your opponent controls can be the target of spells and abilities as though they didn't have hexproof. Ward abilities of those creatures don't trigger. So this is definitely a sideboard card in black decks because the ability to turn off hexproof and ward I think is a really powerful ability because we see a lot of creatures and cards that are specifically focusing on giving creatures those abilities. So I think Nowhere to Run is at least a sideboard card in black decks with a couple copies of it, and it might even be main deckable if we see a lot of ward creatures in standard or things that are going to have hexproof. Next we've got Fear of Missing Out for one and a Red mana, you get an enchantment creature, that's a nightmare, and is a 2-3. And when fear of missing out enters the battlefield, discard a card, then draw a card. And it also has delirium, one of the returning mechanics from the set. Whenever fear of missing out attacks for the first time each turn, if there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, untap target creature. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. So, very interesting card, two mana. And if you have four card types in your graveyard, then you're going to be able to have an additional combat for one of those creatures. Now, where I see this is having probably more impact is in modern, because in modern, you've got all your fetch lands um, where you're going to be able to go fetch up a land. A, a land from your deck by paying a life and you're going to get one so that's going to put one of those in in your graveyard and then just by doing other things you can go ahead and get those additional ones in there and the result of that is that by turn four or five possibly even as early as turn three that delirium mechanic on this card would be activated and because of that i think it's got potentially some modern playability Next, we've got Cursed Recording for two and two red mana. You get an artifact. 
And whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, put a time counter on cursed recording. Then, if there are seven or more time counters on it, remove those counters and it deals 20 damage to you. And it can tap when you next cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copies. So an interesting card here, so four mana artifact that allows you to cast up to six instants or sorceries that you can then copy and hopefully that would be enough to win the game. So I'm not exactly sure if this fits in standard, but I think it has to be at least look at in a deck that's probably doing a lot of direct damage to your opponent. So you shot, you know, you play shock and you're able to tap this ahead of time. So instead of doing two damage, it's now doing four damage or a lightning strike, it's not doing three damage, it's doing six to your opponent. Some, some combination of cards like that I think is where this would work in standard but I don't know if we have enough burn spells in standard to really make that playable. Next we've got Twitching Doll which is our buy a box promo for one and a green mana. You get an artifact creature that's a spider toy. It's a 2-2 and you can tap it to add one mana of any color. Put a nest counter on Twitching Doll and you can tap it and sacrifice Twitching Doll, create a 2-2 green spider creature token with reach for each counter on Twitching Doll, activate only as a sorcery. So very interesting card here. So every time you tap it for mana, you're going to put a counter on it. And then later in the game, you can sacrifice it and create a green spider with reach for each time you've actually gone out and tapped it for mana by using those nest counters. So I think this is something that potentially will see play in standard. I'm not exactly sure what the build around for this is yet, but I think there probably will be a build around for this because that ability to tap this four or five times throughout the course of a game if your opponent can't kill it, and then you come back and get all of those creature tokens as a result of that, I think is powerful enough that you would want to do that in standard. All right, those are our previews from MagicCon Amsterdam for Dustmorn. The pre-release for Dustmorn will be beginning on September 20th, so we're going to have about two months with Bloomborough before we see Dustmorn enter standard. So thanks for staying to the end of the video. Um, on the screen I put up my video for foundations and also the previews we've gotten from Bloomborough. So take a look at those and remember to like and subscribe to get further content like this throughout preview seasons. Thanks, I'll see you next time.